Uh, oh man, I'm going to butcher your bat last name. I know it. Um, Dwayne Wohenmut. Welcome up. Welcome up. And his spouse, <laughs> Leanne Robertson. Much practice, it's all good. <laughs> and his spouse, Leanne Robertson, who's in the uh, background there, live in Yellowknife Northwest Territories and have spent many summers and many months paddling and hiking together throughout the Northwest Territories. Their two boys, age eight and five, have been on many of these month, uh, months-long adventures. Uh, most recent long trip has been 90-day voyage in 2022 from uh, Biku Ko, Northwest Territories, to the tundra along the Coppermine River. Paddling from spring through autumn with two children in tow is a story of how paddling has transformed into a uh, preferred way of life in the summers. Um, oh, off camera work here. Uh, if you remember, the Nostalgian magazine came out about a month ago, and this is the write-up that uh, these two have written. And so, there you go. So, generally what happens is I contact these uh, writers for the magazine and I'm trying to get a different perspective uh, where you have read the story now and they're going to tell you maybe a slight twist of the story and you can also quiz them on details and stuff so that's the the point of these zoom meetings um, is to get a different perspective of the printed matter you're reading basically so I'll turn it over to uh, Wayne and uh, Leanne welcome Welcome. Awesome. Great to see uh, lots of people here. <clears throat> I'm just sharing my screen here, so hopefully you will be able to uh, I'll see this in a moment there. Does that work? Does everybody see the screen now? Yep. Awesome. Fantastic. So yeah, thanks, Gary, for the introduction. Um, you probably know who uh, Leanne and Dwayne are now on the screen, but uh, this is Emil. He's eight years old. And this is Alexi, he's five. So when we went on this trip, um, they were, that was of course 2022. So they were uh, actually four and seven on the trip. And then we also had our dog along. So um, yeah, this is uh, one of my favorite photos on the front there. Um, Emil and Alexi played lots with any kind of objects they can find on the land. On the land. And especially uh, this was a nice huge uh, caribou shed we found. Awesome. Okay, so um, here, I have to move the screens around here just a little bit once in a while so I can see. Um, okay, so um, a few things we'll talk about. I I, I decided not to reread the article, so I, I would avoid um, talking about what I wrote in the article. So um, yeah, the topics we want to cover, um, kind of our goals on this trip, and then just a little bit about gear. Um, I'll show a general route map, and then we're gonna talk a lot about um, just the kids' perspective and what it's like to do long trips like this with children along. And then um, I'll go into more detail about the route, um, specific parts that we did. And then uh, a neat little key piece about where we were going is um, kind of the influence on the map by Franklin. And then if we have time, we'll see, uh, we can go into a little bit of how we do food planning. And then, of course, questions and answers. Awesome. And then also, if uh, if anybody wants to, um, if anybody wants to ask questions in the chat along the way, I might be able to um, answer them along the way. So, yeah, awesome. Hey, super. I've only got one screen here, so uh, <laughs> I'm working on it. Okay, so um, trip goals. We, I don't know if we had ever done this before we went on this trip, but we didn't really have a point A to point B route. Um, we had a lot of different reasons to go on the trip and it wasn't point A to point B. We just wanted to spend time on the tundra and uh, you know had all these other goals, but um. It was a good exercise. I would actually encourage other people to do that on the trip so that you can better define kind of why you're out there. Um, and kind of for us, it's just really like, yeah, it has 
become just our way that we prefer to spend our summers is out canoeing. And it doesn't really matter much where we are or what our route is. It's just, we'd rather be on the land eating fresh fish and berries and being active and paddling than we would then in the city, you know? So, um, it's kind of important to make sure that, you know, at least that we recognize what, what people are going for. Yeah. Uh, Leanne, you got to maybe sit closer to the mic where you're breaking up a bit. Sure, sorry. Um, I, I think it's important to have that discussion too. Like, we don't we don't always manage it before we actually leave, but we, we often you know within the first few days, you know, just make sure that we we check now, in. Something's happened. We are, your mic is faded. Uh, can you hear me all right? I can hear you right now. Try again. Yeah. Try again, Leanne. That's okay. Oh, that's better. Okay. It might have just been an introduction. Might have been. Let us know because yeah, you're faded again. Let's uh, your phone. Let's go closer to the. Let's go closer to this. Yeah, you're fine right now, uh, Wayne. It's just yeah. it off and it like cuts out. Yeah, right. If it keeps doing it again, let us know. Um, it's good now. Okay. We'll let Dwayne talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, here we go. How do we? Ah, there we go. Okay. So a tiny, tiny bit about gear. This is uh, just a picture of our boat. Um, we did it with two kids and a canoe, or two kids and our dog in an 18-foot prospector. And then uh, we managed uh, with just two 60 liter barrels and a four season tent. Um, we don't take any fuel or any any uh, fuel stoves. We do all of our cooking on wood. So uh, when we were on the tundra, we just took a little twig stove um, and then a bug tent, of course. And uh, we rely a lot on fish. So we had two fishing rods along. And yeah, so this is a general uh, route map. Um, it's a bit zoomed in. So if you know the NWT much, um, you can see Yellowknife at the bottom and uh, that's Great Slave Lake on the bottom. And then the upper left is Great Bear Lake. And then uh, I should have marked Tree Line on here, but Tree Line kind of goes through a little bit northeast of Wikwedi, not much north of Wikwedi. So our trip wasn't a huge number of kilometers, about 800 and then, uh, yeah, over 90 days. So. And we started just on most recent trips. I've started actually counting how many fish we eat. So <laughs> we ate 73 on this trip. Okay, so then, yeah, I want to talk first about uh, kind of kids and what it's like to canoe long trips with kids. And um, yeah, there's uh, as far as like gear goes and making sure the kids stay happy and trying to make it comfortable. Um, there's a few things I noted that I wanted to mention. Um, we take a potty for the kids so that they don't have to get up and out of the tent in the night to uh, go pee if they uh, if they need to. Um, it makes it so much easier too when they need to poop. Um, they can just poop in the potty and then we can go dump it in the bush and clean it out. Um, and certainly the bug tent, I would consider doing a trip on my own without a bug tent, but I'd never consider going on a trip with kids without a bug tent. Um, we also take more sets of clothes for the kids than we do for ourselves, just to make sure that they're always comfortable and dry. We want them to really enjoy the experience and not have to suffer. Um, we might be willing to suffer a bit if we have wet clothes, but, uh, we want to make it as enjoyable as we can for them. And, um, lots of healthy snacks. The kids, um, our kids are still young enough that they're not paddling a lot, so then, um, in the boat, they're trying to entertain themselves. Um, and one of those ways is eating a lot of snacks in the boat, of course. So we bring lots of healthy snacks for them. And then they usually don't eat as much at mealtime because they've been eating snacks, right? Because when we land on shore, they want to go play. That's their active time, right? So um, because they eat so many snacks in the boat, then they just want to go on shore and run around and play when we're wanting to relax and, you know, have a meal. And then, um, yeah, just making sure that they have really good quality and warm layers and clothes and then good quality bug jackets for them, too, so that they can, uh, you know, stay out of the bugs as well when they are bad. 
But uh, yeah, so these are just, uh, I'll go back to that for a minute. Go through a few good photos and just things that the kids do and entertain themselves on the trip. Um, on the bedrock, they were uh, always wanting to make little their own little rivers down the bedrock. So we'd get containers and haul water up and then pour it out on the bedrock and they'd make their own little rivers leading down to the lake. So this is them uh, working on a river. <laughs> And of course we took this tiny little soccer ball along. So they played lots of soccer on the beaches and wherever else they could find a spot. And uh, they did some reading in the boat as well. We took a few magazines along. So this is them uh, relaxing with their books. And uh, this, uh, because we were cooking with our twig stove, then uh, they would help gather little branches. We mostly cook on the tundra with dwarf birch because it breaks easily and there's usually a few dead branches under every dwarf birch plant. So uh, this was uh, Emil and Alexi helping gather and break dwarf birch. And then of course, Alexi just turned four on the trip. So we had a little celebration of his birthday there as well. And uh, this is uh, one of my favorite moments on the trip. Um, Emil caught the biggest pike of the trip and it just so happened it was on the tundra as well. And he has this slime phobia and didn't want to really touch the fish. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I guess like uh, like a bad dad, I stressed him and I said, uh, Emil, you're never going to forget this if you uh, if you don't pick up this fish for a photo. Like when you're 19, you're going to regret that if you don't pick up this fish for a photo. And we won't have any photo of you, this big pike of yours. So I managed to like pressure him to eventually get over his slime phobia and uh, try picking up this massive pike he caught um, that he reeled in all by himself. So this is him kind of trying to get over his slime phobia. <laughs> and then uh, there on the right, you see him, uh, the kind of one of the better photos we got of him actually holding it properly without his slime face on. <laughs> and, uh, and this is another photo of him catching a trout on the beach. Uh, near tree line. <laughs> so that was a wonderful moment. And uh, just like us, they enjoy the views. So this is Emil and Alexi looking, gazing out over the eskers. Um, this is right at the end of tree line as well, north of uh, north of Aquedi, kind of on the Winter River. And uh, it's a good photo of, of beaches and uh, a little fire. The kids, uh, you can see a meal working on a little craft. So we took along a little bit of um, fabric and sewing supplies. So they did a few little sewing uh, projects along the way. And then Emil's got, you can see a few pieces there beside him on the beach. They often made their hours. Yeah, there was quite a few times that Emil would have his own little fire going just to uh, practice and learn. You know, he's learning to be his own... Uh, Canoe Voyageur, right? Eh? And then Arctic Cotton was a great entertainer. They both gathered lots of Arctic Cotton to stuff some of their sewing projects and just to play with. And one of the favorite toys they have along is their own little mini canoes with their own little tiny men and characters, women in the canoes. And they would tie ropes to these and then play with them in puddles on shore or even drag them beside the canoe. So there's uh, Alexi dragging it beside the canoe on the water. And then even on the tundra, we found a few trees. This uh, massive willow was actually growing right beside obstruction rapids on the copper mine. And uh, so Emil went up and climbed it. It's amazing how big those willows are. And uh, this tree, um, they climbed as well. You'd never guess, but this massive, it's so huge on the bottom, but then tapers so quickly upwards. Um, we found this spruce tree um, in a little grove of trees right on Point Lake. So um, that's way up north too, uh, uh, north of tree line. And then um, they loved picking berries. So that's a great activity. With the kids, they spend tons of time picking berries. You can see Alexi's, uh, I think that's a blueberry face. And then uh, this is a meal. He's picking cloud berries there. 
And then uh, I guess an emphasis on the bug tent. This is the bug tent we took along. It just sets up with paddles. Um, we did use it quite a bit um, just to be more comfortable with the kids and meal times. And that's the starvation river behind the tent. So that's uh, one of the river we went down, the last river we went down to get to Point Lake. So yeah, that's kind of uh, a little summary of uh, kids' perspectives. And then uh, we'll go into a little bit more about the route. So um, this is just a Google Earth map um, with the lines traced of our route. We went up the Snare River from Bechico to Wekwedi, and that's a traditional uh, Clicho Aboriginal route. Um, and we went pretty early, so we got to see a bit of uh, ice along the way. There's also a couple of hydro dams on this route, so. Um, it's, I believe, about a 35 kilometer stretch with multiple dams. And because of the dams in that route, uh, you never know whether when they're going to uh, do a water release. So they don't really want you paddling that route. So we got a ride around the route. So um, there's a road that goes from the top to the bottom. So they gave us this, uh, gave us a ride and that's the sign that's on that road. Um, I thought there was a nice picture here. Yeah, so this picture now is uh, a waterfall on the Snare River. This is upstream of the hydro dams of the ways. And then there's a good field of ice. We were early enough in June that uh, there was a decent amount of ice, not in the river or on the lakes, but just on shore where it freezes thick from overflow during the winter. Um, some burns as well on the snare rivers, so we got to portage through a few uh, black burnt forests. And we got to Wikwedi just in time for the Aboriginal Day Feast, so we got to meet some locals there and uh, eat some of the food that they had prepared for Aboriginal Day. And play some games. Yeah, play some games, so that was the 21st of June. That we're wearing. <laughs> yeah. In town. In town, We're even. So yeah. Um, and then the next uh, section of the route from Wikwedi was crossing the tree line. So we went northeast up the snare to Winter Lake. And then from there, we went north upstream on the Winter River. And then we left the Winter River to go through Big Lake and Starvation Lake. And then down the Starvation River to Point Lake. And then starvation. Okay, so this I think is Winter Lake. Anyway, good photo. Um, this is again uh, just on the way to Winter Lake, a beautiful cabin we found. A super cool table with three branches of spruce and just cobble cut off flush and then a plywood installed on top. Probably the coolest table I've seen. Mm -hmm. And some graves along the way, recently maintained and rebuilt. So, and uh, this is the, what does this one say? I have my screens over top. Winter River, right? Yeah. So this is where we left Winter Lake and started going upstream on the Winter River. And we thought we were starting to get off the beaten path. And then right away, we came across this old plywood skiff on a portage that we didn't even know whether it was really a portage, but we just chose the easiest route because based on maps and whatever. And it just so happened that, yeah, we took the same portage as they used to take. So this was a cool score, cool find. And uh, north of the Winter River, you really get into some beautiful Esker country. So there was quite a few um, amazing Eskers up that way and beautiful beaches. And I believe this photo is Starvation Lake already. We had uh, one of the most amazing beaches on that lake. And this is Emil. Yeah, Emil sitting in his bug jacket there. And then down the Starvation River. So um, the Starvation River was mostly just a small meandering river with kind of continuous flow and not so many portages, but uh, this picture is uh, one of our portages around this little stretch that dropped really quickly and had lots of rocks. But it was a beautiful little uh, quaint river with lots of Arctic 
Dr. Grayling. Um, there you can see again the Starvation River Valley with the river flowing through. Um, it just so happened we hit the Starvation River at the worst bug time of the year. So we we hurried quite a bit down the Starvation River because the bugs were horrid for that few days. Um, but uh, um, it was a beautiful river. Um, it has one nice little canyon stretch that, uh, um, I guess I didn't have a photo of it. One beautiful little nice canyon stretch that was the best Arctic grayling viewing spot I've ever seen on a canoe trip. We were riding over the water and uh, it was maybe six feet deep and really calm. And so you could uh, you could see like at any given moment we could count at least a half dozen grayling in the water and yeah it was just amazing to see. So then we arrived at Point Lake and then right away we were on a big open cold lake with lots of wind and the bugs like almost completely went away right away it was so much nicer as far as bugs go. And so the next part of the route, so you can see on the um, on the upper left, the squiggly, really squiggly line is the Starvation River. And then we hit Point Lake. And so part of our goals for the summer was to go visit Daring Lake Science Camp. And we had um, a couple of friends coming in to join us at the Daring Lake Science Camp. So Daring Lake is the lake uh, where the green line ends there on kind of center right of the screen. So we went there to pick up our friends. We gave a presentation at the Daring Lake Science Camp, and then we turned around and came all the way back to Point Lake. So um, on the Copper Mine River, we had to portage up past the obstruction rapids. So that's the rapids uh, just upstream of Point Lake. And uh, in here, the, the Copper Mine, of course, is flowing northwest through Lake Providence and then through Point Lake. And the line, the orange line across the map is the Thelon Esker. That's um, a big long esker that I hiked back in 2020. And so I knew this area a little bit and it was nice to come back with the family in tow this time. So there's a good photo of Obstruction Rapids. It's uh, it's a big river there already. Um, it maybe doesn't look so big in this photo, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty impressive rapids. There's an old caribou hunting lodge on Lake Providence that we stopped to check. And of course, like a lot of other old camps in the NWT, there's all these old fuel barrels that are just kind of neglected and starting to leak. It's a, an environmental catastrophe waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. You can see the old caribou hunting lodge there in the distance on the left. This is a view from the beach, from a beach there on Lake Providence. And just another uh, nice view of Lake Providence. Lots of bedrock. And um, while we were kind of between Point Lake and Lake Providence, the bugs just completely disappeared. And we've never seen this on the tundra before. This was uh, um, certainly new to us, but this picture, we were at this little point on um, Lake Providence, and it was a hot day, like probably the upper 20s, dead calm, not a ripple on the water, and not a black fly to be seen, not a single black fly. You could lay naked on the beach for hours and never, like we were there for probably two hour lunch, extended lunch break, went swimming, fishing, everything, and we never swatted a single black fly. So I don't know what happened to them. It was like they had an epidemic too, you know? But uh, it hit them worse than us, I guess. And this is just starting out of Lake Providence up towards Daring Lake. And this is... Uh, this is a little rapid. So there's a river that drains Yamba Lake and Daring Lake, and it drains down into Lake Providence. And it doesn't have a name, so we just called it the Daring River because it drains the last I lake on that. Say again. No, no, just, just, but I have to read all this stuff, and I can't yeah. concentrate. Understand? Yeah, it's okay. I just muted them. Okay. So um, so yeah. So this is a little rapid and a waterfall. Um, there's a little waterfall off the screen to the left here, but the river makes a little S-bend around um, 
around this rock and there's an esker that crosses the river right here and it was just a beautiful gem of a spot so we stayed there for a few nights if you look closely you can actually see uh, leanne and the boys out on the rock in the middle of the river the rock that the river makes a bend around we love that spot so we spent a ton of time out there and uh, there was a really good fishing spot at the bottom of this rapid so it was just an awesome spot to hang out we hiked the esker in both directions and yeah, and this is actually where Emil got his big pike. That's right. Way up on the tundra near Daring Lake. And this is the Esker, hiking the Esker right there. And then that's the Daring Lake Science Camp. So they, they do a kids camp there for NWT students every, uh, every August. And then uh, there's various other research activities that go on in this area as well. It's kind of a research a camp to support research on the tundra. Um, and so we got to spend a few days there. Oh, my screen is frozen. Okay. And so that's where um, our friends Myra and Miriam came to join us. So they flew into the camp and joined us. And so now we were uh, we were six people. And we did a little hike up to Yamba Lake, which is just north. This is the Lexi, who was spending lots of time uh, just gazing out at the beautiful scenery. And uh, on our way back down the Daring River, we stopped and we hiked to this um, erratic. So basically, it's this big, huge pile of boulders that looks completely out of place and was left behind uh, by a glacier when it melted. And the landscape is quite flat. But then right in the middle of the open tundra, there's this crazy conglomeration of rocks. And uh, so Emil and I, we both... Um, hiked up there. So this is a photo that uh, somebody got of us when we were, uh, or I guess of me when I was up there. But uh, Emil was there too, but just not in the photo. But this thing was multiple stories high. It was crazy. No, you were up there too. Yeah, that's right. And uh, just a beautiful picture. I couldn't help but throw this in there of uh, Kulu relaxing on the rocks beside, this was Lake Providence. Beside what? And uh, another photo of Lake Providence. This was just a good photo of uh, Windy Tundra. We spent a few days here and there windbound. Um, I think most of our windbound days were actually on Lake Providence, just the weather timing. Um, but... And so then uh, when we got back to Point Lake, our biggest objective kind of for the last few weeks was uh, to explore Point Lake, hopefully to find some caribou and uh, do some esker hiking. So this was our route that we did. Um, we first went up to uh, the drainage that comes out of Itchen Lake. So we had a few tips that um, the caribou generally come down from Itchen Lake, that direction towards Point Lake. And so we thought, well, we were a little bit early, like the, the caribou migration hadn't really started on mass yet. So we thought if we went to that north end of Point Lake, we'd have more luck more chance of seeing them and uh yeah we got really lucky there we um got to do quite a bit of caribou watching right along that drainage out of itchen lake for a few days just a nice beach on uh point lake point lake also has some beautiful cliffs so we got to do uh a few uh paddles under the bottoms of beautiful cliffs and catch some really good trout, really good trout fishing next to cliffs usually, because there's so much, I don't know, the trout love cliffs for whatever reason, and deep water. There's another photo of a little camp spot we had on uh, Point Lake. And another, uh, another cliff on Point Lake, another orange cliff. <laughs> And then uh, I was doing a bit of experimenting, taking photos through our little monocular. So there's a cow and calf caribou um, through the monocular, taking a photo through the monocular. And then this is actually the drainage that comes out of Itchen Lake. So here we're right on that northeast corner of Point Lake where we spotted a lot of the caribou. And uh, another, just a little break on Point Lake. 
it's a it's incredible to yeah point like is huge i can't remember how many kilometers it is across but um yeah you could spend a whole summer exploring point lake more cliffs rocks um so then we did some esker hiking along um along uh point lake this was a super cool spot there's a little stream that flows down parallel to the esker and this this is where Emil and Alexi um, took their little canoes and they spent a couple afternoons just like following their canoes down this little stream. Like they were on their own little river canoe trip. It was pretty amazing. They uh, they loved this spot. This is also where we found the one massive tree on Point Lake that they climbed, a huge spruce. And beautiful fall colors have hit it just right. We were able to stay on the tundra right until the 4th of September. So the last kind of week of our trip, we got to see these most incredible color changes on the tundra. Another uh, one of the Esker. Yeah. And uh, this is one of my favorite shots. I I think Leanne took this one. Eh? Anyways, got to see the caribou on the skyline and uh, right from the boat on the water. And uh, this was another cool caribou that just kept wandering around us and came super close and came and looked at us and thought we were caribou. And <laughs> it was an interesting uh, character. And uh, on the Starvation River, we uh, we saw four bull moose over just a couple of days on the Starvation River. So it was, um, yeah, it's just this, little protected valley with lots of willow and dwarf birch and so there's a lot more vegetation along that river than on the tundra in general so um yeah it seemed like a moose hot spot right on the tundra we surprised one coming around a corner and uh, we probably got within 30 or 40 feet of this one big bull moose and then uh also some um, I forget the type of swallows the, these were, but um, if you look closely at the photo, you'll actually see uh, a few swallows in mid-flight. You can see a couple uh, kind of center bottom flying right around the nest. And then there's another one kind of right at the top in the middle that uh, you can actually see flying. Um, there's another one on the far left that's mostly just a blur, but uh, yeah, it was amazing how many birds were in this little spot. And then, um, yeah, I wanted to just, I don't know if other people heard about this, but um, wanted to emphasize, like, this was the probably the strangest thing of all summer was um, how, you know, for the first while on the trip, just because of normal bugs and having kids along, like, we had pretty much every meal in the bug tent for a while. But then um, once we hit Point Lake, right at the end of July, all the bugs disappeared. And then we never used the bug tent again. And our bug jackets all got put at the bottom of the barrel. The 21st of July was the last day we used our bug jackets. And after that, it was like paradise. Like I remember thinking about um, messaging friends in Yellowknife, you know, in early August and telling them all, you better come to the tundra right now because it's amazing. You never get August, you know, early August without bugs. Like you guys should all fly up here and enjoy it. <laughs> um, certainly in our experience, we've never seen anything like it before. Do you think it's something to do with the fires? Uh, well, this was 2022. There wasn't a okay. lot of fires that year, um, but it was really hot and dry. So. Certainly the hot, dry weather certainly would have been part of it. Um, but yeah, it just, it's still, even, even with the hot, dry, it just didn't make sense that they were just completely gone. Like we went days and days and days, weeks really, without any bugs. Like even the, the spots that should have been horrendous, you know, really sheltered along a rapid um, on a calm day you'd maybe be swatting once, once in a while, you know, once in a while you'd find a black fly. But um, yeah, we spent so many, so much time napping outside and writing in our journal outside. And um, it, yeah, it just, wow. It didn't feel like the Northwest Territories, you know? Cool. Um, 
So yeah, a little bit about um um so we took along Franklin's journals from his first trip to the Arctic coast. Uh that was back um what year was it now? It was uh night uh 1820. 1820 yeah so 200 years that's right it was 200 years basically from when we did this trip and it was amazing to see how many names on the maps i had never realized how many names on the map all come from his one overland expedition um so the starvation lake and the river are both named after that trip because of all the people that died basically starved to death and then obstruction rapids is named for uh that's where they they couldn't cross the Coppermine River because they had left their canoe behind. Um, their canoe was destroyed, and so they had to. They were there for a few days until someone managed to create a new little um, willow canvas canoe that was able to take one person at a time across the obstruction rapids. You know, and this was, I think, October already when they were already almost all like skin and bones from starving, walking back from the from the Arctic coast. Crazy. And then uh, Lake Providence was named for them. And then there's a whole bunch. Yeah, Coronation Gulf was named by Franklin. And a lot of places along the Arctic coast um, were named from that expedition. And then Green Stockings Lake as well. Anyway, it was crazy. There's no limit. <laughs> it's like there's so many names from that one, one expedition. Um, yeah, I guess I've gone through this fast enough. We'll, I'll talk really quickly about food. We don't do food like a lot of people, I guess. We don't do meals. Um, see. Wow, okay. So Brian Johnston put a comment in the chat about ha not have, using his bug jacket on the Thompson River too. So yeah, we're not the only ones. Nice. Thanks for that comment, Brian. Good to know. Um, so yeah, food, we um, we rely a lot on fish. And we take the time to collect lots of berries. Uh, we take sprouts along as well, so we're always growing sprouts. Um, our food quantities now are changing every year based on the kids and how much they're growing, but uh, we managed to do fine and even have a bit of surplus food carrying just 4.4 pounds per day. So we do everything based on weight for all of us. For all of us, that was 4.4 pounds for all four of us. And then um, we don't do meals, so we just take along a bunch of carbs and lots of proteins and uh, lots of dried vegetables and dried fruits and then snacks and nuts and stuff. But um, we just do it all based on weight and uh, we'll pack a few days in a bag, you know, kind of thing. And that was us making um, cloudberry jam. And then uh, Point Lake, the trout there were incredibly dark. I don't, I've never seen trout so bright, bright orange, bright red. Um, so that was just amazing to be eating. And they tasted different too. It was amazing. They're so good. Reading with the Arctic Charm or something. Yeah, something. Sorry. So yeah, I think that's uh, basically everything that we were going to uh, talk about. So um, we definitely have some time now for questions. Okay. If so anybody has The uh, best more way is stop presenting and then we'll see everybody and people can you know, turn their camera on and ask a question. So okay. thanks very much. Oh yeah, here we go. Right, so, forget. Yeah, that was excellent. Thanks. I'll start off with the first question. Um, can you have the boys tell us what their favorite part of the trip was? Mm, sure. Hey, Emil and Alexi. There's a question for you guys. Yeah. So we want to know what your favorite part of the trip is, or was. Yeah. Coming into the camera a little bit. What was what was the favorite part of the trip for you? Um, that place where we put the canoes in and just dragged them all the way down to the river. Yeah. yeah so the one, the one photo I showed where they played in the stream by the escort for a couple of afternoons with their little canoes. Yeah. Awesome. What about you, Alexi? What was your favorite part of the trip? The same thing. The same thing, yeah. That was a hot spot. Eh? <laughs> Excellent. All right, we'll open it up to other people. Um, Jerry's got his hand up. Yes, yes. I wanted to ask, in the article you mentioned about you never filter water. 
I want to hear more about that in the the guardia that you suffered from that. <laughs> yeah, so um, right at the beginning of the trip, um, the first few lakes are um, so right when you leave Mexico, the first few lakes are silty and really warm. So they're not lakes that we would typically drink from straight, but those were the only lakes we were worried about. So at the very beginning, we um, we were just boiling water. Um, but I think we stopped boiling water just a tiny bit too early. And Giardia, of course, takes a week or so before the symptoms appear. And uh, so as soon as we got Giardia, we're like, oh, that was that one lake that we decided, eh, you know, we were like, eh, should we drink this yet? Should we not? And we did. And then uh, that was a mistake. We should have gone, you know, one or two more lakes further before we started drinking straight from the, from the lakes. But uh, yeah, the water generally... In a lot of the lakes here, the water is so cold and so clear that the, you know, the parasite count or the amount of parasites in the water is super low. And we we never take a, I shouldn't say we never, there are a couple of routes we do take a water filter on, but um, certainly this route had a lot of really cold, clear lakes along the way. So we weren't worried about the water. So, I mean, we've been doing that for all the years we've been um, canoeing up here and, um, for the most part, we're good, but there's been a couple times where we've, yeah, where we've got Giardia. But we've also learned that, uh, uh, I guess, like I wrote in the article, that fasting for 24 hours has always cured it for us. So um, when we got it there on this trip, we just, uh, Leanne and I both fasted for 24 hours, and then we were good to go. And the trip just went on, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not ideal getting it, but it's not. We have a pretty I'm sorry, we can't hear you. You're broken up again. All right, all right, you go. I don't know. It it every time you open your mouth, it goes into mute. <laughs> Try again. The um, Leanne, Leanne was saying the uh. We carry a first aid kit that also has antibiotics for Giardia. Yeah. So in the case that, you know, we can't get rid of it with a 24-hour fast or if the kids, it's bothering them too much and they don't get over it, then we can always revert to those antibiotics. But we've never had to use them for ourselves or the kids. So. All right. Okay, thanks for that. All right, anybody else interested in a question? Okay, I've got another question. Uh, I noticed your there's a lot of big lakes you crossed, and it didn't look very stormy. Uh, was that typical that you said you only windbound a few times, a few days? Yeah, we. I would say we were lucky. We got less wind than I would have expected. Um, yeah, we only had a few. Lake Providence, the timing, for whatever reason, the timing, Lake Providence, we had a few windy days. We had a few decent travel days with nice tailwinds, too. But, um, yeah, we didn't have a lot of storms, so it was good that way. Okay, great. Um, now, I noticed those rivers that you're running down, um, what class of rapids would you be doing with your kids in the, in the boat with the dog? Everybody in there, I guess. Right. Yeah. Like, well... <laughs> Class one, there, there's, uh, we've done, class one would be max, really, with the kids and the dog. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah anything more than that, we'd be portaging. Yeah, mm -hmm. the kids, the kids aren't old enough to swim on their own or to rescue themselves, you know, so, um, yeah, that's the max, you know, until, until they can swim on their own, and we're confident that they could swim through a rapid and get to shore in case we can't grab them and help them, you know. Okay. Yeah. And um, with the wind, yeah. we also don't, like we have lots of we have lots of time, and so if we need to take an afternoon off, it's it's like it doesn't affect us as much because we just have we have time to 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 deal with it and take that day off. So it doesn't. Right. It, it, we we did have windy days, but it wasn't like yeah. You're not time pressured to get somewhere. Exactly. So you yeah. somehow don't notice it as yeah. as much. And we also have like zero tolerance for wind with the kids in the boat. Yeah. So we're we're very wind averse. 
Yeah. Now, can you tell us about the portaging? Because with two kids, you got to stay with the kids, I guess, eh? Or all travel together is a lump. Yeah. So what we did was um, there were a few long portages, but we staged them. And Emil's very mobile, but Alexi still has pretty short legs and has a bit of a challenge with a lot of the shrubbery on the portages. So what we did is break up each portage into multiple stages. And that way I could walk faster than the kids or Leanne could walk faster. Like, But we would just do a short stage and have the rule of always keeping them in sight. Yeah. So as long as we could divide the portage up into small sections and keep them in sight, then we didn't necessarily have to walk the same speed as them. And um, we could go back and forth a couple of times while they just did it once that way. So one person is mostly ahead of them, one person is behind them, and then we, you know, you do the fox and the fox and egg, yeah, hopping yeah. back and forth with gear. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you didn't have any issues with animals, um, you know, bears and stuff like that? We didn't this summer. We had one wolf that um, I think was just randomly traveling you know, past our camp, and it just kind of walked right into our camp. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't show any signs that it actually intentionally came into camp. It was just kind of like curious, and all of a sudden it was just there, and we're like, whoa, okay. <laughs> but it showed no signs of aggression or anything, and um, um, Leanne, like, when Leanne and I came close, then it took off right away, so yeah, yeah it was gone pretty quick. Yeah, you would think with your dog being there, everything's thinking twice about entering close right yeah, yeah. she's a little bit embarrassed about that uh when she was on double bed for about a week afterwards i think she was pretty ashamed of herself that she had not caught that coming in so neural issues are pretty big retracted yes all right yeah strange enough um Ever since we've been canoeing with our kids, we've had only one bear, only one time that a bear's come in really close to camp. Um, but we've had two wolves you know, come right into camp. Um, one we actually had to shoot with a rubber bullet. Okay. Uh, we started carrying rubber bullets in the 12 gauge ever since we have kids. And it's just so nice to be able to inflict a bit of pain on an animal without injuring them. At a distance, and you don't have to wait till they get close enough for bear spray. Yeah. And uh, the one wolf we shot with a with a rubber bullet was um, back on Great Bear Lake on another trip, and that wolf was gone, and it never came back. So, um, yeah, so carrying that shotgun with rubber bullets is pretty nice. But um, yeah, we it's amazing. We've had we would never expect it, but we've had you know two wolf encounters since we had been canoeing with kids, and only one bear encounter since. So. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about the caribou and what's the name of the herd and stuff like that? How many did you see? And Yeah. Um, so when we got to, right when we were getting close to that outflow from Itchen Lake, where it flows down into Point Lake, right away we started seeing these little groups of caribou. And so that's the Blue Nose East, right? It's the Blue Nose East herd, which is much smaller now than it used to be. So it's there's a way fewer caribou, but um, we managed to hit the migration pretty good. They weren't bunched up in one big group. They were just all these small groups just kind of steadily going past. So we were there for two nights, three days, and uh, there was just this constant little stream of uh, small groups of caribou going right past our camp, like within you know 100 or 150 meters of our camp, and then swimming the river there. Um, yeah, it was magical to see lots of calves, which was um, kind of um, inspiring that maybe they'll be able to bounce back. You know, they're having lots of calves and reproducing well. And then uh, one day we also had a, a big bull moose that we were camped right beside the Esker to kind of stay out of the north wind because we had a pretty good um, cold north wind at the time. And uh, so we were camped under this esker, and one evening, this big bull moose walked on top of the esker right behind camp and then turned and crossed the river. Uh, it, yeah, it felt like wildlife Serengeti, you know, for a few days. It was just constant animals everywhere. And we hiked up this one uh, hill nearby, and uh, we, with the monocular, 
Like all you had to do was watch for a while and like exactly. every few minutes you'd find another caribou wandering in the tundra somewhere. Yeah, it was it was magical for sure. Mm -hmm. It was and we had talked about gold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget the wine. Oh yeah, okay. And one of the uh probably our main goal for this trip was to get to see to get to see caribou. Before they might not be and we realized that the the time seems to be running out to the so we really wanted to get our kids to to see and experience this majestic animal. Yeah, Emil, uh, there was a comment I'll never forget. Um, after one of the days there at the little outflow from Itchen Lake, after we had seen so many caribou, then Emil uh, said at the end of the day, he had never he had never seen caribou before this trip. Um, and I uh, said, oh, that was the best day of my life. <laughs> I was like, all right, we accomplished a few goals this yeah. summer, that's for sure. If he was, uh, you know, Ending the day saying that was the best day of his life. That was awesome. Watching yeah. caribou. Yeah, and kids, they just need simple things generally, right? Like you mentioned the little river you made and stuff like that. It doesn't take much to entertain kids. Um, usually they're back paddling, dragging their paddle in the water. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've experienced that yet. If you give them a three-foot long paddle, they just drag it all the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, they did lots of that. Yeah. Yeah, and just like every new campsite they would hop out and just be so eager to explore this new campsite and this new location right and see what they could find it was amazing like they're just so eager to have a new spot to uh, explore every time you change camps you know? yeah. we realize how key is going to be that one all right they picked hopefully up we get uh is there anybody in the audience that wants to ask a different mm -hmm. question that i haven't answered or asked or whatever No, we got Brian, maybe. Gary, yeah, I can jump in and ask a question. I, yeah, it's kind ahead, of a, it's a weird question because I'm enjoying the presentation so much, and it's it's about a topic that um, it's good. And I want to ask a, a, a question that has nothing to do with the topic, really. But uh, <laughs> how's your Nemo uh, bug tent? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, you know, oh, it's not. Um, what would I say? It's not the most expensive bug tent out there, and it's not the most durable one either, but I would say uh, quality versus price. It did pretty well. We were pretty happy with it. We had to sew and repair the corners a little bit where it tugs tight. Like, it's made to uh, tie on the diagonal super tight to kind of taller points or tall paddles, and then the opposite two diagonals tie lower down and kind of shed the water that direction. So those cords, where those cords attach on those diagonals is not quite as strong as it should be. And so we've had to repair that a bit, but um, it's done a few trips for us and seen a lot of use. And uh, for the price, it's been amazing. Yeah. And it has no external poles. Like it's just no. used. Yeah, I noticed. Which is, it makes it a, yeah. a totally different weight. Ring than yeah. And it only weighs about 2.6 pounds, I think. It's mm -hmm. quite light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I have, have the used same, it in, same unit. Yeah. Have you used it in the wind or the rain much? Rain, yes. Bugs, yes. But generally in southern Ontario, it's, you know, a lot of trees around. You've got an extra challenge where you've got to put your uh, paddles up. Yeah. Yes. As it becomes windy, the bugs go away and the tent has to go away. It doesn't, it doesn't hold up at all, I would say, in the wind. The Nemo certainly isn't the best bug tent for the tundra because it doesn't handle the wind very well because it you know it would need like one low end you know to be able to point into the wind maybe to prevent that but um yeah so by the time the wind the time you're worried about the wind with the nemo the bugs aren't quite gone there's like a little margin in there where there's still bugs but there's too much wind for the nemo so there's a little bit of zone there where yeah you want to like if you really use it a lot on the tundra, it's nice to set up the Nemo in a sheltered spot so that it doesn't get blown away by the wind. But then that's where the bugs are worst outside of the tent. You know? So, um, yeah, it's not the perfect tundra bug tent, but we've made it work. I find even if there's bugs inside, they all go to the top corner. They're always trying to get out. So once you're in, you're good, you know. If they're black flies. Yes, the black flies, definitely, they only go to the top and growl. And those are the worst. 
since I find anyways. But yeah, if you do get big mosquitoes in there, they're not quite so good at going to the top corners of the black body. Haven't trained them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Mm. Any other questions from the audience? I'm just looking. I'm scanning the horizon. I think most people. Oh, maybe Eric's got some young children. Eric, do you have a question? Thanks. Uh, thanks for asking, uh, Gary. I, I just uh, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say uh, how much I appreciated the, the presentation. I've only taken my son out. He's a he's a four year old as well on a few uh, relatively short trips. So. I'll definitely be employing some of your uh, your uh, recommendations in terms of keeping kids busy and occupied and, you know, introducing them to longer trips. So I, I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Good luck, Eric. Hopefully, you uh, got to whittle uh, a little canoe, Eric. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Take a little canoe along and put a hole in it. So you, put a on it you know, yeah, it'll be good to go. <laughs> Can I ask how many hours you put into pre-trip food prep and what kind of snacks did you take for your kids? How many hours? How many hours? How That's many months? Question. How many months, maybe? <laughs> we dehydrate all of our own food. So it's uh, it's definitely a job when you're doing a 90-day trip. Um, we buy nuts, of course, um, but I make my own jerky. Um, we dehydrate all of our own fruits and all of our own vegetables. And then, uh, and then organize and sort cards, you know? Um, yeah, just the dehydration alone for like 90 day trips for the four of us is, uh, I don't know, yeah, yeah probably start, a, a so month of work, you know? Yeah, we like start that. a year in advance, so we have yeah. to start collecting. Keeping the dehydrator going, pretty constant for a long time, yeah, for sure. I mean, it means that we don't have to spend a lot on food for these trips, but, um, but uh, yeah, it is definitely a lot of time, for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, we just we spend a lot of time prepping food. But um, one thing I've never really mentioned in presentations or talks, but like this trip, especially doing long trips, um, you can actually make them really inexpensive because you don't have to use charters as much. I guess partly because we were able to, uh, we know enough people now in the Northwest Territories, we were able to use a backhaul from the tundra and. Um, so we got that for super cheap. And then we got our food drop just shipped to the community in Wakati. And the other food drop we got was uh, just came on the plane for free to Dairy Lake Science Camp. So like- We definitely tailor our trips around those logistics. Yeah. We don't for long enough. But... Exactly. So the 90 day trip for us is actually cheaper than a two week trip, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. Do you, do you carry about a month of food, dried food? With two kids, yeah, I think the most we did was 35 days or so. Okay. But when it was just the two of us, we did 60 days of food yeah. just okay. for the and that 4.4 pounds is the dehydrated weight, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what we used this past summer. Yeah, so that's about 100 pounds, 120 pounds of food for the 35 days. Okay, yeah, exactly. That between so is that like two barrels full of food? Exactly. Yeah, we took. Okay. Uh, we had two to sixty liter barrels for food. So, and a lot of the time we were able to fit our pots in those barrels too. I think at the beginning of a couple of them we had to keep the pots out for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then you mentioned you you fish a lot, so that's your your core protein, I guess. And yeah, exactly. Energy food. We only eat fish twice a day, a lot of the time, and uh, sometimes even three meals a day. But uh, yeah, it's it's a bit of a skinny, hungry day if you don't get fish. <laughs> yes. yeah. Now, how do you cook the fish? Is it just open fire or what do you do? Boil it or? Um, on the tundra, it's a little more challenging um, because there's not as much wood, so we can't really grill it much. Yeah. Um, my preferred way is just to grill it. Like if we have a, my preferred way to cook fish is to take a grill along and then just lay it skin side down on the grill over a really low, you know, coal bed. And um, that's definitely my preferred way. But, um, or to cook it on a rock, that's even better. Um, 
every once in a while, if we find a nice flat rock, then I'll just um, I'll just uh, put that rock on top of a few others so that I can put a fire under the rock and then just put this the fish skin side down on top of the rock. And it the rock just like distributes the heat so well and it cooks so perfectly evenly and you can get it just like just when it's just cooked and super moist. Yeah. So that's amazing. But on the tundra, yeah, it's a lot tougher. So we would either boil it on the tundra or um or fry it sometimes just in a pan on the twig stove. But it takes a lot longer to cook fish on the tundra because you have these tiny little wood fires. And um, because you don't have a big enough fire usually to uh grill fish, you know. And we left our grill behind um, um, near with Reddy, there was a, a kind of a mm -hmm. spot where we left the grill that was there. Like, we're not gonna need this anymore, so we're, we're on the tundra now. <laughs> and the fish are basically grayling. You mentioned pike, trout. And sorry, I'm just gonna have to bow out. I'm just uh, taking the kids to their Christmas concert. So thank you everybody right. for thank coming. You. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So yeah. Um, oh yeah. So the trout. Yeah. So we um, at the beginning of the trip near Yellowknife and along the Snare River, there's a lot of warmer water. So then there's a lot of pike. Um, but uh, all the big cold lakes, it's mostly trout. And then in some of the colder streams, colder rapids, we'd be catching uh, grayling. But uh, overall, for the whole summer, we definitely ate way more trout than anything else. Okay, okay excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. And the trout, the trout is my preferred fish anyway. It's so good, and it's a little fattier than other fish, so there's actually more yeah. calories in it, more calorie dense, you know, than, say, a pike or a whitefish or a pickerel would be. Did you have any Arctic char in that area? We didn't. Um, late in the fall, when there's the char run, then I think you probably could catch char. Um, you definitely can catch char in the Copper Mine River. Um, I've never talked to people that caught them in the or near obstruction rapids, but I'm sure they do come up pretty high up on my river. So we of all remember the chance of getting char in Point Lake and uh, along the rapids of the copper mine. But um, we were mostly on the big open lake and we didn't catch any. Um, although, yeah, there probably was that possibility anyway. Because there are very red kind of orangey flesh fish, you know. They are and they're delicious. They're so good. Um, they certainly do have a slightly different appearance on the outside. So I'm pretty sure we would have known it if any of the fish we had caught were char. But yeah, I wonder, I do wonder, I should talk to a fish biologist sometime yeah. about um, cross fall nation. Why those trout in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had, I had one those char trout were once so dark, right? a couple years ago and it was very orangey like that, reddish orange. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, if there's no more questions, um, last call. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dwayne, and your kids and your wife. Uh, that was excellent. I mean, I could see this presentation was so much more than the print article, you know, with the insight you shared and stuff. So it was excellent. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks for uh, thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for everyone who attended. And I hope, uh, yeah, I hope uh, we can help inspire a few people uh, to get out with their kids or uh, encourage others to get out with kids. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so much fun. I mean, it's it's more work with kids for sure, all the support you have to give them, but uh, it's also so much so much, so rewarding to see the world through their eyes and the things that they find that entertain them and. The surprises that they see that you maybe don't notice, you know. So yeah, it's amazing. It's it's it changes the canoe trip so much, you know. Yeah. I think your trick is actually you don't have a super heavy time pressure. I mean, you had to get places, but you had a, so much buffer, and that's what you need with kids. You need to be able to sit and say, No, we're not moving in the rain or we're not doing something, right? To have that buffer. So it takes the pressure off the parent too to you know get things done and move. So I think that's probably one of the takeaways people can go with if they're dealing with kids. 
because you know you, you you're trying to make it comfortable for them of course yeah i think and uh oh there you are okay yeah we lost you for an instant oh you're on mute now <laughs> sorry there we go we're back sorry about go. that yeah i figured it out though again we're back okay um, good just before i got cut off i was gonna say gary i don't think i could have worded it any better that uh yeah longer trips with kids are easier than the short ones because you don't have that time crunch and you have more time flexibility and you know mm -hmm. if kids are having a really bad day or if you have bad weather you can just be like nope we're just gonna sit put yeah. and uh, enjoy the day and relax and we'll travel another day, you know? Yeah, and I think also, you know, your spouse, Leanne, I mean, you've gotta be in the same mindset, the two of you working together and, you know, so, and it rubs off on the kids, of course, all that, uh, um, you know, how you deal with stuff, of course. But yeah, it was excellent. For sure. All right. Yeah, uh, hopefully, uh, yeah. Hopefully, the uh, kids will learn some good uh, what resiliency, and in addition to all the outdoor skills and fun outdoors and learning outdoors, but just like resiliency around, you know, when you're outdoors, you got to make decisions for yourself and yeah. deal with nature on your own. There's no one else there you can ask to deal help deal with it. You know, it's no, I agree. You. Yeah, no, it's an excellent thing for leadership going into the unknown not being scared of the unknown because over the next hill, it's just another hill and it's no big issue, you know? Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's very good for kids, I think, to gain this uh, skill set. And even when you, you know, put them in camp when they're like, whatever, 12 years old and on, they're learning other stuff, right. From uh, leadership and socialization or whatever. So it's all good stuff for building a, uh, a well-balanced adult. <laughs> Yes, true. All right. I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, thanks, everybody. And thank you, Wayne. Um, I'll try to post this in the next week or so on our YouTube channel. So if anybody's missed any part, uh, you can play it over. All right. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Bye, all. Thanks. Thank you.